up, everybody? Welcome to Sunday Sessions, Episode 6. I'm here to answer your questions about growing your Amazon business. Today's focus is going to be scaling. What needs to be done to scale your business from whatever revenue you're at now to that next level, whether that's hiring employees, delegating tasks, streamlining your efficiencies, whatever it is, it's going to be talked about right here in Sunday Sessions, Episode 6. Enjoy. So whether you're in your garage and it's just you and you're looking for that first employee and you want to scale to a warehouse, whatever that next step in your business is, let's talk about it because I don't feel like it's talked about enough. And I think a lot of us, the goal is to grow our business, right? Myself and probably some of you included, I didn't get into this reselling industry to build a multi-million dollar business. It just kind of happened. You know, Sebastian didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, I want to build a $40 million a year Amazon business. Little by little, little by slowly, we were able to just continue to grow month over month, year over year, and build this massive business. So it happened. It happened almost naturally, organically. It wasn't our set plan to do this. But as the years go on, we continue to innovate. So that's what I'd like to focus on here, how you can innovate and how you can scale your business. So if you have any questions specific to that topic, this is the place to ask them right here because I'm answering them for you. All right, so the first question here, at what point did you hire an employee? So our first employee was a packer, someone who essentially packs products. I think it's one of the most important aspects of growing your business from you know lower revenue to that kind of mid-level revenue because you gotta think about it like this, right? Your time is valuable. The less time you're spending in your living room, your warehouse, your storage unit, your garage, wherever you're located right now, the less amount of time you can spend doing the manual labor aspect of growing your business, which most of it is packaging products, labeling products, checking them on Amazon, boxing them up, repackaging them, making variety packs, kits, bundles, and then processing them to ship them to Amazon. The less time you spend doing that, the more time you have doing the higher level tasks. And what the higher level tasks are, are like bringing in more inventory. So think about it like this. Let's say you value your packer their time value at $15 an hour, which is pretty reasonable, right? So you could pay somebody $15 an hour instead of you doing it. Now your time value is probably more expensive than $15 an hour. Let's say it's $30 an hour. So you're paying someone half of what you're worth to do the job that you've been doing. So while they're packaging your products, you're purchasing more inventory. So let's say instead of packaging products for four hours, you spend those four hours doing product research and you place a $10,000 order, you know, at 20% margins. That's $2,000 in profit. So now in those four hours, you just generated an additional $2,000 in profits for your company while someone else is producing the inventory to send to Amazon. So now not only are you saving time, instead of you costing yourself $30 an hour, which is your time value times four hours, it's $120 you would cost yourself. Now instead of costing yourself $120, you're only spending 60 to pay an employee to do that job and you're bringing in 2000 so that's 1900 and what $40 that you're now making in those four hours instead of spending your time right it's all about that shift in your mentality definitely without a doubt first position um, is a packer 100% my friends 100%. Is having a business bank account absolutely necessary when starting? I think it's necessary, 100%. So what you want to do, the value of having a business bank account, think about it like this uh, from an accountant standpoint and even a protection standpoint. But first, we'll, we'll get over the accountant standpoint. Just think about how complicated that's going to be. You send your, your bank statements, your credit card statements to your accountant, and then they literally need to figure out what was a business expense, what was a personal expense. You got laundry, you got groceries, you got travel, was the travel for work, was the travel for a personal. It's just very hard to figure that out. So I encourage anybody just getting started, 
pay the 200 bucks, register an LLP, which is a limited liability partnership or an LLC, a limited liability company, um, or sole proprietorship even, not really, I prefer to go the, the LLC route, but register your business, create a separate bank account, keep your funds separate. And the reason why I encourage LLCs over sole proprietorships is because the protection, right? It's a limited liability company. So it protects you from, God forbid, anything was to happen. It separates your business accounts and your business finances from your personal finances. So if something was to happen, they couldn't seize your personal assets, which very rarely does happen, but it's good to have that additional protection. So if you're really serious and you're trying to get started, just register the business. In most states, it's probably between 200 to $300 to do so. And on our YouTube channel right here, you can just search, um, I believe it's called how to register your business. So you can just search that on YouTube right here and, and check it out and you can register your business literally today. The process varies a little from state to state, but it's pretty much the same process. What should we be looking for when we are not finding profitable items in retail? Um, so this guy's doing RA and his question is when he's not finding profitable products in retail, what should he be doing with his time? Oh, so I personally think you should be growing relationships with wholesalers and the reason why, listen, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that wholesale is the route to go. And why? Why do I think that? Let's break that down for a second. Why do I think that wholesale is the best business model on Amazon.com? For a few reasons, and I'll cover them right now so everybody can clarify why I think so and why it is. Let's say retail arbitrage. You find a couple great products. You're going to Walmart. Um, you could get 10 at this store, 10 at that store, 10 at that store. So you spend an entire day sourcing 60 units. You got to go to this one 10 miles away to get 10 units. You got to go to this one 15 miles away to get 10 units. You got to go to this one five miles away to get 10 more units. So you spent your whole day sourcing 60 units. Now, what if I told you through building relationships with wholesalers and distributors, you can get access to pretty much the same products, but instead of having to travel all day to purchase 60, you can, with the click of a button or the pickup of a phone, you can purchase 400 of those and get them shipped right to your house, right to your warehouse, maybe even right to Amazon. You just saved so much time, so much time. So don't get it twisted. I'm not saying retail arbitrage is not a great way to build revenue and grow your business. Absolutely. Our first couple of years doing RA, we did over $10 million just selling retail arbitrage from Costco, BJ, Sam's Club. I got some good friends of mine right now who are doing, you know, $1.5, $1.8 million a year just doing retail arbitrage. But they're calling me and they're saying, hey, E, I'm at that point now where I just can't do this anymore. I'm running around like a madman. I'm running around like a mad woman trying to source inventory from all these different stores. I got two teams of people going to these stores, another team of people going to these stores. I just can't get enough inventory. And that's where the light bulb should go off. Like, okay, what do I need to do? I need to eliminate the middleman. Who is the middleman? Brick and mortar, right? And this is a great picture I like to paint for a lot of you. So I wish I had one here. I probably got one in my shower. But uh, Dove, it's a 16, I think, 0.9 ounce. It's a Dove body wash. Right, I know from all of our distributors, we get it for right around 160, 165, maybe 170. So less than two bucks, right? Let's just say, let's call it 165, we get it. That same Dove is sold in Kroger's, ShopRite's, CVS's, Walgreens for $8. So they have an incredible markup on these products, brick and mortar stores. So that same product that you're crushing it, getting it from Target, you know, paying 20 bucks, you might be able to source it in large volumes from a wholesaler for 17, you know? So you're able to save those $3, but more important than the $3 is your time, the time value. What is your prospect for the future of Amazon wholesale? Does it, is it still worth it? Yeah, I love this question because I'm a firm believer that Amazon wholesale is not going anywhere. Think about it. More people are shopping on Amazon than ever before, right? There's over 150 million Prime members. That is a lot of people. So people are looking for products, everyday products that they normally get at their local grocery store. They normally get at their local uh, bodega corner store. They're looking for these branded products. 
because they use them every day. They trust them. Listerine, Crest, Mitchum, Old Spice, all these everyday products that you use, I use every single day of my life. I know what they smell like. I know what they feel like. I know how they work. I believe in them. I've been using them for decades. I want more of them, so I go to Amazon to buy them. That's not going to go anywhere. If anything, it's going to continue to grow, and more shoppers will sign up for Prime Access and have Amazon accounts to get direct access to the products we're selling. Number two is Amazon will never change their business model to where they're actually making these variety packs, these bundles, these multi-packs, these kits. They're never gonna do that. It's just not profitable business model for them. They're in the volume business, just like I'm in the volume business. I wanna move as much inventory as possible. So Amazon needs third-party sellers the same reason why in 2020 over 60 percent of the sales came from sellers just like you and I they need us right now does that mean we're important to them probably not do they have any problem getting rid of us probably not but in small quantities right this seller's misbehaving breaking Amazon's TOS get rid of them that's something they do frequently that's why I encourage everybody to operate a perfectly legitimate Amazon business so you don't have to worry about getting suspended or anything like that. But my true belief, I see Amazon Wholesale being very lucrative business model for 10, 15 years to come. I really don't see it changing. Um, A lot of our clients, they're crushing it, continuing to grow month over month. I was just looking at my sellers app. We literally, from today, a year ago, our business grew 100%. That's mind blowing. I'm not talking 100% when you're doing $50,000 a month or $100,000 a month. I'm talking last year this time we were doing $2 million a month and this year this time we're doing $4 million a month. So to be able to grow a business like that, stuff like that doesn't really exist anywhere else, maybe in the tech sector, but e-commerce is exploding. People are literally changing their lives every day. So I do not think Amazon Wholesale is going anywhere. If anything, it's going to continue to grow. So now, today is the time to get started. Um, What advice do you have on maintaining a culture which drives others to refer their friends and family? Yeah, so I'm assuming you're talking about culture in the workplace, right? And this is a huge, huge topic for us. And we are firm believers that culture should be a priority in the workplace. We've all had shitty bosses. We've all had shitty employers. I don't like a shitty boss. I don't like a shitty employer, right? And you should not be focusing on being a boss. You should be focusing on being a leader, There is a huge difference from being a boss and being a leader. Think about when you think boss. I think someone's bossing me around, telling me what to do. When someone is a leader, when you or I are a leader, we are guiding our tribe. We are guiding our people in the right direction, showing them through action. We have no problem pulling our sleeves up and getting our hands dirty, packaging products when need be, moving pallets around the warehouse. That is what a leader is versus a boss. So that's the first thing you need to do is be a leader. The second, incentivize your team, right? Why does everybody wake up at the ass crack of dawn and go to work? Because they're looking for a paycheck. Most of these people are supporting their families off of the salary or the wage that you are paying them. So incentivize them when they work harder. Hey, if you hit this goal for this quarter, you get an extra 500 bucks. You get an extra 600 bucks. You get an extra $300. It will push them to work harder and focus on the growth of your company. And when our company grows, when your company grows, you should be able to give your employees an added bonus. So they feel like they have a role in the company. And when the company is affected by their role, they get compensated for it. Also, create culture through having meetings, right? Right now in our warehouse, we have a bi-weekly meeting where we just cover topics, updates, any COVID updates. Uh, We get everybody donuts and coffee. Um, Everybody kind of shows up. We laugh. We crack some jokes. Um, So we're building an atmosphere of growth. Um, We also have an open door policy, we like to call it. Literally, my office, Sebastian's office, Humble Ted's office, open all the time. We encourage employees to come, stop by, let us know what's going on. Right? If they need to take two days off, we want them to be able to come into our office and feel comfortable sitting in the chair across from us and saying, hey, E, man, you know, my son's going through this. My husband and I got this whatever. You know, we want them to feel comfortable being able to discuss that with us. 
So we have an open door policy. Some other things we do is just give them the things that they need to thrive at their workplace, whether that's installing a vending machine, putting lockers in, also making sure they have all the supplies so they could do their job correctly. These are all some value points that you should be assessing within your business and making sure that they have access to it. Do they have a nice place to eat lunch or are you just telling them to go sit in their car? Give them a section that is theirs. Make them feel welcome. Make them feel like they're at home. Also, I encourage, obviously right now it's tough with COVID. We haven't had one in about a year, almost a year to the day. But have end of the year parties, have quarterly celebrations. If your business is performing well, like on every Saturday, it's usually pizza Saturday. Every Saturday, about half of our, our staff comes into work and we reward them for that. We get them all pizza and sodas. And yesterday we did salsa Saturday. So we got everybody tacos and it was just great. Everybody gets to step away from work for 45 minutes, hang out together, eat together. Um, and just kind of network and grow. We are a close-knit family. Treat your employees like family that you love and are stern with, but fair, if that makes sense. Getting a warehouse and need your help for structuring the expansion. Uh, so Giorgio Span, I suggest, um, you know, we have in our, I suggest joining our program. And uh, honestly, if you're doing, if you did what, 1.5 milli last year, one point. 2.7 million last year, it's like a no-brainer, man. We literally break down how we organize our warehouse, the best workflows. We show you how our, our warehouse manager, Greg, processes inventory and trains each one of our staffs. It's a no-brainer, man. Send me a DM on Instagram. For wholesale, how much inventory do you purchase at a time? It depends, right? You need to purchase as much inventory as your staff or you can produce on a weekly basis. So if in a week your team of two people are producing 4,000 items and that's them working 40 hour weeks, then that's how much inventory you should be purchasing. Right, I can't give a set number like you, you should be purchasing because A, it depends where your business is. B, it depends on how much inventory you can produce. If you have one employee and you could only produce 2,000 units a week, then you don't need to purchase 15,000 units because they're just gonna be sitting around. So it really depends on how fast you can produce your items. Like I know right now in our warehouse, we produce about 12,000 items a day. Um, and we're working five and a half days a week. So 12 times five is 60. So we're producing about 66,000 orders a week. So I know that every single week, we need to have 66,000 orders at minimum. What if it's a really great week? Then we need more than that. At minimum, our production team to stay employed for the full time that they normally work, which is eight and a half hours a day, and we offer overtime Monday through Friday, and we offer Saturdays. So really it's like 10 hours Monday through Friday, and then four or five hours of work on Saturday. I know that in order to keep that staff employed, I need to bring in at minimum 66,000 orders. Um, packaged ASINs, that's what we consider orders. Um, so you need to analyze your numbers. Break it down, basic math. Uh, when do you recommend is a good time to get your own prep center going? So basically you're saying, when do, you, when do I recommend getting your own warehouse? Listen, when you analyze the fees and you're just spending a lot of money, I was in a clubhouse call last night or two nights ago and we ran some numbers, basic numbers. I forgot the math off the top of my head, but right now someone was using a prep center and they were spending almost $5,000 a month on prep services, right? So you figured average dollar a unit, $5,000, they're producing 5,000 units. So we ran the math. We said, you know, two employees at $13 an hour, you know, times a full year is whatever, $50,000 a year. Um, and then, you know, a warehouse, small warehouse, 2,000 square feet, it's another 1,000 bucks a month. So now you're talking another, you know, $12,000 a year. So now you're at like $62,000, $65,000 a year. Um, and if you're spending $5,000 a month in prep services, that's already 60000 So you're, you're basically, the amount you're spending on prep services, you could put into a warehouse. Um, you could put into hiring an employee or two 
and then you'll be able to grow your business. And the reason why we process a lot of inventory in-house is I like quality control. I like to be able to touch the product, feel the product, see the product, make sure what the end consumer is getting is what they want. So those are a few reasons, and, and you'll know, man. Listen, when, when a prep center is eating all your profits, that's when you might need to consider. You know, but also some people they don't want, they just want more hands-off business, and that's okay too. There's some different ways of selling on Amazon. Not everybody wants Wants to have a warehouse. Some people never want to touch a product, and that's okay too. We we help a lot of people like that. They just want to get the product shipped to a prep center, shipped to Amazon, or shipped from the wholesaler direct to Amazon. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't care that they're making a little mess, less money because they want more of that passive income type. Um, but keep in mind, it's tougher to grow like that. Hey Eric, what's the approach with distributors? when they don't give you the good list of UPCs. So I would use their not good list and I would put, put together an order. And the reason why I say that is to say this, we had a company we were doing business with for about seven, eight months, and they were giving us that list, the not good list, right? Uh, no UPC, Excel file, they were giving us PDFs with the UPCs, with the spaces in them. You literally had a copy, paste, copy, paste. Some of them didn't even have UPCs. And we were like, you know what? I see there's some value with this company. Let's just, let's do the manual research. Let's spend the time. It's not a lot of time. Instead of taking a day to put together an order, it might take two and a half days. Initially, it's a little bit of time, but once you place that first order, then it just becomes a reorder and having some new SKUs added. So it, as the time goes on, those bad lists that you're talking about get easier to deal with. But long story short, uh, we placed, you know, first order 10,000, next order 15, then 30, then 50. And then the company reached out to us and they're like, listen, we, we, we have an Excel file. And it's like, oh, you have an Excel file. How coincidental, you know? You told me for eight months you didn't have an Excel file and now all of a sudden we spend $60,000 with your company and an Excel file appears. So it's really just about the relationship. A lot of these companies, they don't know who you are. You could be a broker. One of the least favorite things for wholesalers to get their wholesale catalog into the hands of a broker because then that broker is purchasing inventory, brokering deals at higher cost of goods and making money on that increase in the cost of goods. So um, long story short, build a relationship, man. Do the manual search and you may get that file sooner than you think. It's possible. Daniel just got his account and his gated and everything. What to do? Scan, 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 my friend. You're not gated and everything. If you were gated and everything, nobody would ever be able to grow an Amazon business. People are selling things right now. So take your little seller's app on your phone, start hitting stores and start scanning stuff. Or place orders with wholesalers and distributors where you're purchasing the minimum purchase quantity, which is 10 units or more, for that ASIN and submit invoicing to get approval. Uh, Danny said, been watching your course for three days straight, loving every minute. So many questions you answer for me. Amazing, Danny, exciting to hear. All right, so Lucky D27 said, what's up, Eric? I remember you mentioned before you pay your buyers a commission structure, do you pay them on a monthly goal or quarterly only? And do you deduct refunds, FBA storage fees? Yes, 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 and yes. So we pay our uh, buyers a set salary, and then we also pay them quarterly bonuses based on profits, right? So let's say um, right now, what are we doing? We're doing like 700,000 a month in profit. So let's just say that's the cutoff, right? 700,000 a month, or let's keep it basic, $10,000 a month. $10,000 a month is the minimum my company wants to be making. So that's $30,000 a quarter, right? So then you say, as soon as you hit $30,000 a quarter in profits, then you begin to become incentivized. Then that commission structure comes in. Whereas if every dollar amount over that, you get a percentage of the profits, usually around two to 4%, depending on you know what you can work with in your company. Um, but we will pay that out every quarter. And now to your second point of your question, absolutely, we're deducting you know refunds and products that have been in stock. So what we use is 90 days or more of inventory. If a product that a buyer has bought is in stock for more than 90 days and it's not moving, we deduct that product from their total profits. 
So we analyze their profits, we deduct that. Also, if a product has a ton of returns and we had to pull back the inventory, we deduct that. Um, if it was purchased incorrectly and it's been in our warehouse for a long time and now we have to liquidate it and sell it at a flea market or sell it to our employees, we deduct that. So you definitely, you have to, because then you could run into this issue where they're just buying a lot of inventory because they know some of it will make money and then all of a sudden, a month goes by and you have all this excess inventory because people are just buy, 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 buy because they're trying to get that incentive. So what is the starting point for developing those wholesale relationships? Is it just a well-written cold call email? Yeah, you gotta break the ice. You gotta get their attention. You gotta get somebody either on the phone or contact them through email and just explain a little bit about what you do. Like, hey, my name's Eric. You know, I operate a large e-commerce distribution company in, in New Jersey and I'm looking to grow my product catalog to better serve my customers. Um, I'd love to get access to your Excel file with UPCs, case pack and pricing. And if you have any account applications, please send them over. Here's my number if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You know, keep it short, keep it sweet. You don't want to divulge too much information. The main goal is to get that catalog. And then really what grows relationships at the end of the day is that paper, my friends. You gotta spend money. You gotta spend money. Listen, I own a wholesale company. I know when I get emails, I'm usually opening the ones first from the people that have done business with me and who've spent five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in the last month. Um, because the other people who always ask a lot of questions and never place an order, never spend any money, I know it's just a time suck. And the wholesalers and distributors you're dealing with are thinking the same way. Because it's like you want to prioritize your time to the people who will generate money for your business. So it's just basic economics. Okay, Eric, would you miss home decor stuff with health and beauty or stick with the same theme? I'm a firm believer in selling anything I can make a buck on. I don't care what category it is, and you shouldn't care what category it is. You should literally sell any products you can make a couple dollars on, whether it's in baby, health and beauty, personal care, grocery, uh, industrial and scientific, outdoor and patio, sports. Doesn't matter. If you can make a couple bucks on it, sell, sell, sell. That's what's gonna grow your business. Don't try to focus on specific categories, right? We're not talking private label here, we're talking wholesale. Wholesale is a volume business. Sell as much inventory as possible. That's what's gonna grow your company. Um, how long have I been selling on Amazon? Seven years. How to find wholesale suppliers? There's a link right here, click it. How are you giving the bonus? per pallet or a goal on packaged items. So what this gentleman or lady is talking about is our, our bonus structure for our warehouse employees. So our bonus structure for our warehouse employees is per packaged items. So, you know, on a weekly basis, we're producing about 66 to 70,000 items. So we'll do that and we'll break it down to quarterly. So let's say quarterly, what, 66, how many times 12? So you're talking a lot, you're talking 600,000 orders. This is just in my example, your example is probably completely different, but you know, we're saying, all right, so we want you to produce this quarter 600,000 order and anything over that same thing as the buyer incentive. You get a, you get whatever, if you go, uh, you know, 0.05% over that, you get $400. And then it goes up from there. If you go 1% over that, it, you get $600. You go 1.5% over that, you get $800. And it really pushes them to work harder. And what I love about it is you can literally see it. I see these, these ladies and guys come in in the morning and they're looking at, on our wall, we have a calendar that documents the production each day. And they're looking at it and they're with their calculator and their phone and they're running numbers and they're doing everything they can do to hit those goals because they're incentivized, right? They know if they hit those goals, they make more money. Now with the same thing that I was just talking about with Lucky about, the question, um, do we penalize them? Absolutely. If they package the wrong product under, you know, an ASIN that it shouldn't have been packaged on or put the wrong label on it, absolutely we deduct those products from that goal. You have to. You have to penalize them or else they'll just be going so fast and not recognize the mistakes they're making. How do we deal with back order? So for anybody who doesn't know, a back order is when you place an order and it's not in stock with the distributor, so they place it on what's called a back order. And the back orders, the usually the way it works is when it comes in stock, they then ship it to you. 
So we have a pretty firm um, protocol for back orders is we don't keep them on back order uh, because what happens is when it comes in stock, it could be four weeks from now. Right. And then four weeks, you forget about this product. All of a sudden it shows up at your warehouse. They send you an invoice for it. Um, and then you look at the keep a chart price drop five dollars. So we prefer to not have automated back orders in place. But it also depends on the company. Some companies are very good with communicating that uh, we deal with the distributor right now where we have certain products on back order and they email us before they even send the product or the invoice. So like, hey, E, you know, we just got 600 units of this. You had it on back order. Do you want to process this invoice? Other companies, they'll just send you an invoice and ship it out if it's on back order. One of those companies like EE Distribution, um, you know, so we prefer to have more control with our back orders because Amazon's like the stock market. It fluctuates. Prices are going up and down. You want to be sure you're purchasing profitable inventory. I appreciate everybody spending this time with me during Sunday Sessions, Episode 6. Make sure you subscribe to the channel because these are happening every week with other videos sprinkled in between. Posted a dope keep a chart video the other day. One of the most common questions I get is, hey, how do I read a keep a chart correctly? Or, I bought all this inventory um, and I didn't understand keep and now I'm losing money on it. So check that video out. It's a dope keep a chart video. I didn't get to everybody's questions. There's literally dozens of them, but I'm here every week. Check me out. Sunday sessions. We are here to help you grow your Amazon business. I appreciate all of your time. Have a beautiful weekend and a beautiful rest of your week. Stay grateful and stay lit.